it's it's Julian Assange and WikiLeaks that have returned honor to to journalism. Julian is a truth teller, and that's what has upset the those who continue what Goebbels called the big lie. <laughs> that was um, the great John Pilger at the uh, very top and uh, the music is from the third man Anton Karras and I'm Randy Credico this is Randy Credico live on the fly here on the Progressive Radio Network our debut show is today and I've got a great show by the way I want to thank uh, Gary Knoll for giving me this opportunity I've been wanting to do a show at PRN for a long time so this is a dream come true uh and i've got a great show i want to get right into it today uh this is uh, thomas drake a former senior official at the nsa national security agency and a whistleblower who uh is one of the finest profiles and courage i've ever met in my life so uh after just a few seconds of music we're going to come back and get right into our interview with thomas drake Okay, we're back. I'm Randy Credico. This is Randy Credico live on the fly. Uh, one of our uh, special editions, Assange Countdown to Freedom and everything surrounding uh, that title uh, here on uh, Progressive Radio Network. This is our debut show. And uh, as promised, we are joined by a, an incredible individual. Uh, as I said, he is a whistleblower. He's a former senior executive at the uh, NSA, and he's a dear friend of mine now. I consider you a dear friend, uh, Thomas Drake, and welcome to the initial show here at the Progressive Radio Network. Well, it's an honor to be our very first interviewee <laughs> yeah. on, your, on your new, new show. Yes. My new, new show, yes. On a different network. On a different network. Yes, yeah. uh, the thing may be the same, but we're on a different network. And this is a great network. It's got a great reach, a great audience out there. And I, I, you were the first person in my mind. I want Thomas Drake for this first show, especially since we are doing an Assange Countdown to Freedom uh, episode today, uh, which is about Assange and everything related uh, to Assange and uh, whistleblowers and espionage act. Uh, that's why you're here. Uh, and because you're the foremost guest that I've had talking about this. Julian Assange said, when you get Thomas Drake on, it's gold. Always try to get Thomas Drake on. So I saw you recently uh, in Alexandria uh, at the sentencing of uh, Daniel Hale. Now, most people don't know about Daniel Hale, uh, Mr. Drake. Uh, can you give uh, the audience a little background on his tale of woe, who he is, what happened, and uh, what happened yesterday. Well, it's, a, it's, it's actually an extended story that goes back many years. It actually goes all the way back to when he first uh, joined the Air Force uh, in the late aughts, uh, 2009 timeframe. And uh, he actually joined and was a Mandarin uh, linguist. Uh, he had an opportunity to volunteer because it is, it's a voluntary thing to go with JSOC in a special unit. He ended up deployed to Bagram uh, Air Base in Afghanistan. 
And while he was there, he saw war crimes committed by the United States, eyewitness uh, violations of the Geneva Convention. And he realized that dr the drone warfare program, as much as they claimed it was targeting bad people, it was sweeping up massive numbers of innocents who are being just vaporized as collateral damage is the military that interesting word, collateral damage, when it involves the loss of, of innocent human lives because they happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, at least according to, to the, the, the military and, and US foreign policy. He was eyewitness to that. And I think Daniel, as many whistleblowers, and he's a whistleblower, there's no question uh, in terms of, because he ultimately exercised moral agency and could not remain silent and he made a fateful choice. It was a choice he made to go to the press with critical information regarding the drone program uh, in the public interest. And he ended up short, long story short, he ended up being criminally investigated, a national security investigation. Um, he was actually raided unceremoniously in 2014. I met him shortly thereafter. In fact, that's, I met him uh, Sonia Kennebec, as it turns out, was already in contact uh, with him because she was in the process of what ultimately was a very interesting uh, documentary that came out a few years ago that's actually gotten renewed, a renewed second life because of this case uh, called National Bird. And he was one of three whistleblowers that were prominently featured in her documentary. Uh, that's also, um, that's where I first met him. It's also when I first met Sonia. Um, well, five years goes by. This is under Obama Biden, under the same administration, and we'll probably chat about this, the same administration in which I became the signature espionage act case at the beginning of the Obama administration. So guess what? He was not, just like they did not actually indict Assange during the Obama Biden administration, it was actually the Trump administration who decided to move forward uh, and actually indict him. There was a grand jury. Uh, this is a little over two years ago now. Uh, he was summarily indicted, five uh, charges against him, uh, felony counts, espionage act counts uh, for possessing, possessing, for retaining, and for disclosing information to those not authorized to receive it. And uh, he was facing, at originally, he was facing 50 years in prison. I had faced 35. Um, he ended up in a plea agreement. This goes back to the March timeframe in which he pled guilty to one count, but they left the other four out there, sort of the uncertainty or not. It was not a clear, like, we're going to drop these. And then uh, sentencing uh, actually took place yesterday on the 27th at the Alexandria Federal uh, district courthouse before Judge O'Grady had been the presiding judge uh, this entire time. And it was, it was an extraordinary sentencing. It actually brought back memories of my own. In fact, it reminded me, Judge O'Grady's very, very soft-spoken, but it reminded me of a soft-spoken version of my own, presi the presiding judge of my own case, uh, Richard Bennett, but that was up in the Northern District of Maryland in downtown Baltimore. And he, with all the flurry of filings and pre-sentencing and everything else, the government was actually seeking at least nine years, uh, or if not more. They wanted a minimum of 87 months if he was willing to sign yet another piece of paper. It was as if he had never pled out several months earlier. Um, the judge, it was just a, it was an extraordinary, uh, just an extraordinary set of words that he shared, just his own uh, analysis um, as is went on for quite a while. There's a number of things that actually took place during the sentencing, but his own analysis of the case where he was extraordinarily sympathetic, I would actually say compassion was being expressed by the judge uh, despite the fact that he pled out, which yes, it's a serious crime to plead out. You're basically convicting yourself of an espionage act charge. But the judge was, did not have both hands tied. He had one hand tied, but he still had a free hand. And with that free hand, instead of nine years, instead of 87 months, instead of five, uh, five years, it ended up being 45 months. So three years, nine months was the actual sentencing. 
Uh, and he's, he's going to be able to time served uh, because he was in the Alexandria Detention Center uh, since the end of April. And with other programs, uh, because there's a number of, of issues involving his mental health and, uh, and substance um, abuse and other and PTSD and a number of other things that he was direct that direct he was directly affected by and afflicted with. Uh, he's probably going to serve and with good behavior in the in a federal and and they actually asked the judge asked he's looking for something in Northern Virginia. Uh, there's going to be evaluation ahead of time a medical evaluation ahead of time. It's very possible that he will he may not actually serve more than 30 months or so. Um, this is well, well, well side, you know, well, this side of, you know, three years, nine months, uh, if it's even that long, but it could easily be no more than 30 months. There is a three-year probation period um, that was also imposed, but then the judge at the very end uh, summarily uh, dismissed all remaining charges with prejudice, meaning the government can't come back later and attempt to charge him. So it really, it really, it was not a victory for the government. I mean, obviously any time in jail uh, is, is not good, right? Any time in prison, especially as he should not serve any time. He's, he had waited seven years. He's been under this incredible burden for seven years. And the judge even highlighted that. Yeah. And the judge, I mean, and, and Daniel himself spoke, I mean, this, this is another story thing. I didn't even have this opportunity. So the judge has enormous discretion within the constraints of whatever is pled to, right? Because he's the tribunal. There's no jury at this point. Um, the jury ends up essentially uh, is now out of the picture. So now it's just you, the arguments that are made pre-sensing. And, and I mean, the judge actually gave Daniel an opportunity to speak for himself. He invited Daniel up to the stand. And it was, it was already, he had already filed an extraordinary letter in terms of basically what was, was this, why did I do what I did uh, the, the, some days earlier that was filed by his public defenders. But then here's the judge now giving him an opportunity to speak on his own behalf. And it was just an extraordinary, I mean, this is one, I believe once the transcript, the full transcript comes out of the sentencing, uh, and there, no doubt there's going to be a transcript that will be posted um, from, from uh, yesterday. I think it's just going to be one. Of, it's going to be one of those uh, speeches, especially a sentencing. I mean, where it's going to go down in history. I mean, his words were extraordinarily eloquent, incredibly personal. Uh, people were feeling it, you know, in in the audience, and it went on. I mean, it, we were talking this side of you know seventeen minutes, and the judge listened very, very intently. Well, I did too. I got to tell you something. I I admit I was crying. Yeah, no, I had tears in my eyes. I mean, it was an extraordinarily moving personal. He even turned around and thanked, individually thanked all the members of the prosecution team, including the FBI agent who was also part, part of the prosecution team on my own case, uh, which of course, I mean, I had some flashbacks about that because she was like the ever present FBI agent. Uh, it's sort of the eyewitness for for the prosecution, but it, it was extraordinary. I mean, it was. Why just, did he do that, Tom? I what what was the motive? Uh, is it just because they were doing their job? He was acknowledging that they were just doing their job, despite the attack dog, lightning rod, you know, point prosecutor of of Gordon Cromberg, who clearly who's also assigned to the Assange case, by the way. Um, yeah, I mean, they're doing their job. They're following orders, okay? But it's critical to understand, similar to what I ended up confronting, right? Again, that moral agency. You have a choice. You're now eyewitness to actually violate. People don't understand, just like I was in the Air Force, like, like Hale. I was also a linguist. I, I was also deployed overseas. Different type, time of history. It was pre-9-11 the latter years of the Cold War, although I was later an officer in the Navy post-Cold War down at the Pentagon as an intel analyst, uh, all source at the National Military Joint Intelligence Center, we, don't, we take an oath to a piece of paper called the Constitution. And it's, it's to support and defend it against all enemies, foreign and domestic. 
But when there's also there's also the Soldier's Creed, and there's also the Geneva Convention. Most people don't, and then there's a Uniform Code of Military Justice, which in Article 92 says, you only are required to follow lawful orders. And if you're not certain if the order is lawful, you can question the military authority to make sure it is lawful. And if it turns out it's not, you are under no obligation to follow it. Well, guess what he was eyewitness to? These are orders being given to quote unquote, to target, right? We're talking about, this is supposed to be very, very discreet targeting, precision targeting. And it turns out upwards of 90% of those that end up being killed were innocents. So now you're, you're at, these are international war crimes, which by the way, under the Geneva Convention, guess what? You know, you're now in violation of international convention. Wow. So wait a second. So this weighed heavily on him. Extraordinarily so- heavily. I mean, you can imagine, and he's overseas, you know, he's in a foreign country and he's seeing his own country and he couldn't stand by seeing lives just needlessly sacrificed. War itself is hell. War itself is bad enough, Randy. Okay. But to actually take innocent lives as part of it, whatever you call it. Remember, we haven't had declared war on Congress, by the way, is the only body in the federal government that can actually declare war. We haven't done that since World War II. That was so the all last con- time. Right. That's the last well, time. Like, Vietnam, uh, first Iraq, second Iraq, uh, everything. Never declare war. war. We, have, like, we have these authorizations to use military force. You know, there was the War Powers Act of 73, which was this huge compromise that came out of you know, the end of Vietnam, which, you know, you had the notification, but it was, it was never, it, Congress actually, the constitution reserves declaring war because that's a serious thing. It's the most serious thing to actually engage, you know, the blood, sweat, and treasure of your own country against another people. And to me, war is becoming increasingly anachronistic. Uh, but here, you know, here we are, the American empire writ large, so right? Wait a second, Tom. Tom, I know this. We did not declare war. Congress did not declare war on Afghanistan in 2001. Nope. And in 2003, they did nope. not declare war on Iraq. Nope. How do they but get they away with it? Authorization to use military force under the larger context post 9 11. But we've been there for 19 years in one country and 18 years in the other. That's and correct. We declared war. And that's just military action? Yeah, and we're still bombing Afghanistan, even though we're leaving. As if, I mean, the Brit- we should have learned the lessons from going back to when the British were bombing Iraq way back when, at the beginning of the 20th century. You know, bombing doesn't work. It just actually turns people against you. I mean, just... I, well, say, you know, in it, Afghanistan, you know, I must say this. I, I don't want to be uh, uh, funny about this, but, you know, Afghanistan at home is 30 and 0. They've never lost a war at home. Terrible on the road. They don't have a great road team, uh, but at home, they've never lost a war. Okay, so I'm very familiar with Afghanistan only because of other work I've done in my prior life where you get to see a lot about the world based on technology, right? I've never been in that part of the world, but I know any number of people who have served there, right? I know people that were there in Afghanistan before all of this happened, even before the, the Soviet invasion. Right. Where, you know, the beginnings of Al Qaeda and Osama bin Laden, who is actually, ironically enough, in terms of the history on our side. Right. You know, there was part of the Mujahideen. You know, we were sending stinger missiles and that was in itself. It became a scandal. Uh, Afghanistan has never, ever been successfully invaded by any outsider. You just tick, tick off. And somehow this American exceptionalism is somehow we were immune uh, to the realities of history. There is, there is no special get out of history free card uh, when it comes to America. There just isn't. I mean, this is incredible hubris and arrogance to think that your superiorness, right, uh, can go into a country like Afghanistan and subdue it, uh, invade it, occupy it. Uh, we certainly couldn't. Uh, the Soviets certainly didn't. The British certainly couldn't. Alexander the Great of all people, right? Right. 
right. his greatness. That was the high water mark, uh, the extent to which he could push any further east. So I, it's, I mean, and it's a country the size of Texas. I mean, we're we're not talking, you know, Rhode Island or Connecticut size, right? We're talking enormous country, and because of the mountains, the enormity of the mountains and and, and the terrain, you have, you know, and you also have tribes which they're kind of they're you know unto themselves, right? There's people just the culture, the historical dynamic. People just don't fully appreciate it at all, and this idea that we could just come waltz in there and, you know, plant the flag of freedom and somehow, but yet it became our longest war. Yeah. Well, yeah, let's go back to the Brits. I just want to mention that, you know, they first tried the first Anglo Afghan war was 1840 and uh, they, by 1841, everyone left and only three, 15,000, 16,000 British troops and Indian troops uh, left, uh, and by the time they got to the Kandahar uh, province, uh, they were all slaughtered. Only three or four people escaped that. They tried it again a few yep. decades later. They tried it again in the first part of the 20th century, and they said, all right, we're going to declare victory and leave, all right? So it's an impossible. Why didn't the U.S. learn from history? Seriously, what, what is to be gained? Maybe they don't want to win. Is there something to no. be gained? Who is... Uh, profiting yeah. off of this war. And oh, after- you're now getting into sort of the, the huge massive elephant in the room, the military industrial complex. I've argued that that really was the, the secret government uh, really taking hold due to the National Security Act of 1947, uh, post-World War II, this became now the, the American century, the so-called American century. We were now ascendant. The British Empire had set its own sun it had handed it off for the new dawn that would rise with America, right? So we were now ascendant as an empire. We're reluctant to use the word empire, even you know, in terms of politics, but that's what we, what we have became. The problem was, is that now you're seeking others in which to declare them as enemies. And obviously out of the shoot post-World War II, it's communism, right? Became the rallying cry that really established the basis in the 1950s. As Eisenhower himself said, an extraordinarily powerful farewell address just before the age of Camelot, you know, under JFK was introduced, most people ignored that speech. It's now been regarded as a huge alarm wake up call that very few people heeded because Eisenhower himself presided over the foundations of the military industrial complex. And he actually called it that. You can now add congressional, you can add, you know, surveillance, you can add a lot of other stuff, right, to that. But the fundamental, they ended up, in many respects, what I would call this sort of this unholy, I'm using a pretty strong word here, but an unholy alliance where you have sort of the secrecy, national security, classification, all coming together, and then you're partnered with, with contractors, That's the mil- this is part of that industrial complex, which obviously was was fundamental to prosecuting World War II and us achieving victory against the Axis powers, which some would say was the last great war that you could even argue was a justifiable war, despite how it even it began and its origins coming out of World War I. We just, we don't- We could talk about that forever, the our origins own history, of World like War II. Like, you know that, you and I could talk forever oh yeah, about the origins. No, I, I lived in Europe, you know, my father was a World War II veteran. I just, you were trying to understand world events and the context of world events, not just as some date, you know, happening, you know, in, on a calendar. And I, it's just, here we are though. I mean, here we are. So what happened, NAS security state is what I call it, really became in essence, the co-opting what I would call sort of the normal open government increasingly so, and increasingly con- Congress, which is the centerpiece of the Constitution, it's of the people representing the people, you know, with especially House of Representatives, but you also obviously have the Senate. Um, you know, it's not, it's, it's not parliamentarian, it's a unique form, right? It's a Republican form, you know, it's a unique form of democracy, con- increasingly ceding power to the executive, 
And, you know, you, once you see power, I mean, Frederick Douglass has spoken very eloquently in the past, you know, as the great abolitionist, you know, power just does not yield willingly. It just does not give itself up willingly. And it's always seeking more power. And if you get in the way, guess what? You got to struggle. You got to struggle. So there's a lot of money, the profiteers, the arms merchants, the privateers, uh, you know, it's mercenaries. I mean, that's another word a lot of people don't like to hear, but a staggering in, in, amount of contractors were embedded, embedded uh, in doing a whole lot of the infrastructure and service support in Afghanistan as they did in Iraq and as they have for a while. Uh, you know, why give all that up? You know, why give up all that filthy lucre, right? Because it's a, it's a profit motive. I mean, people sometimes forget that Money by itself can actually be an incredible, I mean, you're perversely incentivizing. So why would you want the war, the war to end? You want to keep it going. There's, you're not incentivized to end it. You're not incentivized to withdraw. If anything, you want to create the conditions and maintain the conditions and which you can justify the continuing existence of the military industrial complex and all of its, you know, all of its varieties. Well, we're getting back to um, uh, Eisenhower. Uh, now, Eisenhower knew this. I mean, he had the secret wars uh, going sure did. In, you and know, the CIA. in Iran, in, yep. in Iran, and in, in, oh yeah, in, well, democratically elected government. Guatemala. I mean, in Guatemala, all taught fifty-four. Yeah, boom. So we I, I want to say this, I know that, which, yeah. but, he, but I'm going to say, all right, here's a guy who was engaged in that. And then he comes out on the eve of losing, uh, uh, transferring to Camelot. Uh, why didn't he do something about it instead of just talking? What, was he intimidated? Uh, did he not have enough power? Does the president really not have that much power, but the people around him and the CIA and the NSA and these other uh, you know, huge organizations. They end up being, they end up being captured. You know, you, you, you pull the drawer out. It's, you know, it's, it's not literally the drawer in the resolution desk, but there is, and it's, you know, even with Hollywood, right? But there is this, this whole thing with the presidential powers. Why would I want to let them go? Why would I give those up? You know, these are cool, these are cool tools and toys that I can play with. It's like, wow. And you're the head. I mean, the power, I mean, we're, people, at those levels, and I was, you know, touching kind of the bottom rung of that at that upper echelon, but at the very, very top, it was extraordinarily seductive, especially when you have power over others, right? Not just your own people, that's one thing, but, you know, being able to exercise military power overseas. Look, I'm flown in military, I was in the military. I had to consider that I could, in fact, give up you know the ultimate sacrifice that i could die in a peacetime you know peacetime or an actual operation or any number of other activities in which i was involved with uh in terms of reconnaissance there was always a threat even when i was flying overseas during the latter years of the cold war i could get forced down the plane could get shot down because the previous predecessor missions in fact had in, had endured that and, you know, I had specialized training because you're like, ooh, you're, you, you committed espionage, right? But you're not like a spy, which gets back all the way back to what's been going on, you know, since Obama with the Espionage Act prosecution for those who dare dissent against our own government, that dissent against the central government is considered this side of an act of treason and you deserve the Espionage Act as punishment, especially if you go to the press because, oh my God, you don't want the press to publish this because then the public finds out. Well, we are going to talk about that after we uh, take a, uh, a short musical break in ID. This is uh, Progressive Radio Network. I am Randy Gretico, uh, live on the fly in the special edition of Assange Countdown to Freedom. And we're speaking in our, our initial show here at prn.fm, uh, Thomas Drake, uh, a real hero, uh, whistleblower and uh, one of a profile in courage. We'll be right back in just uh, 30 or 40 seconds with the great Thomas Drake.
was uh, you and rapporteur, special rapporteur on torture, Nils Melzer at the piano playing Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. And uh, I'm Randy Credico here on Progressive Radio Network, um, continuing our discussion with the heroic whistleblower, former NSA senior executive, uh, Thomas Drake. And uh, did you know that, Tom, that um, Nils Melzer not only is a, a great humanitarian, but a great piano player? I'm not surprised. I didn't know that. I mean, it's interesting. You find people, especially those uh, in, in these kind of roles. And remember, I really, there's, there's, a, there's a waterfront here of activism, protection of civil liberties, universal human rights. And then you find out on a personal level that they have their own individual passions. So it doesn't surprise me, but I only found out recently. Yeah, well, you, let's talk about him just a little bit. Uh, how important has his ingress into the movement uh, uh, to free Assange? How important has that been uh, in, in your estimation? I, I think because of his role, a very active role, I mean, this is not pa he's not passive by any means, um, I, I think it gives it gravitas. It actually gives the entire case, which is really the U.S. case against Assange. Obviously, they have their partners in the U.K., especially given where he is now, you know, it's incarcerated in Belmarsh. And now there's, you know, you did have, you had the, the judge who's did not allow the extradition, which is now being appealed under the Biden administration, right? And apparently in a couple of weeks, they're gonna have an opportunity uh, to, to make their case, at least in part on some of this, uh, attempting to overcome uh, you know, the, the restrictions and so they can move forward with extradition. Uh, I think Neil Neil's is really critical in it's, and from an outsider perspective, not having ever been part of any of this, right? Um, gives it gravitas in terms of how critical the exam the, this, this example, the egregious example of trying to hang Assange and make him and create a precedent in which the United States, just like they did with the Espionage Act charges, they you know they never were for the first time. It took under Obama to get someone actually charged for non-spy activities under the abuse misuse the Espionage Act. This is a use abuse the Espionage Act to actually uh, prosecute a journalist, and so they did everything they're doing. They've done everything they can to say that he's not that he doesn't engage in. No, what they well, it's not up to the government to define what journalism is or what the First Amendment is or what reporting is. Just like it's not up to the government to say whether or not you're a whistleblower. I mean, if I had a reasonable belief that something wrong's being done, well, then guess what? I can come forward, even under the legal legal definition the government provides, not just the general dic uh, dictionary definition of whistleblowing. So Neil is really, I think, given weight to why this case is so fundamental. Unfortunately, a lot of media outlets and not just the United States, although more overseas realize the risk, but the United States, oh, that's Assange, he's not one of us, so hey, he'll take the hit. I know during the Chelsea Manning court martial, having gone to any number of those hearings, that when asked, was actually there in the courtroom before the military judge, when asked, what's the difference? You know, would you be, was it the same, is it the same violation uh, if, if, if Manny had gone to the New York Times, the Washington Post and the prosecutor, military prosecutor said yes. So there is no difference. So they obviously want to create precedent uh, with Assange, but here's the kicker though. He's not an American citizen. He's not a US person. He's a foreign national. You know, he's, he's you know, he's Australian. He's in the UK. So what here's the, and most people still don't get this, Randy. It's really critical for your audience to understand this. Why is the US, and he now under Biden, remember Obama Biden, when Obama was president, chose not to indict Assange, just like they chose not to indict Hale. So why would they pursue, right? going forward, the continuance that Trump indicted, right, Assange, why would they continue under Biden? They need to bring him to the United States so they can violate his protections he's afforded 
once he's in the United States. What does How that mean? Egregious what do you mean? Is that? What does that mean? What does that mean that the protections that he would have? He's at, he's actually outside the constitutional system. We don't have universal. There is no extra constitution for all this exceptionalism of, of Ameri right, American exceptionalism. We can go anywhere. We can do anybody. We can declare anybody enemy combatant. It doesn't matter, right? The whole world's a battlefield. So, hey, if we de decide to get, say that you're a terrorist or we decide to say you're an enemy of the state, it doesn't matter. It actually does matter. He's not an American citizen. So he doesn't fall under the same constitutional protections that are afforded U.S. persons, which is U.S. corporations, U.S. citizens, and foreign nationals that have legal residence in the United States of America, or if you just happen to be in the United States, even General Hayden, the former head of both NSA and CIA said that if Osama bin Laden crossed over from the Canadian side of the Niagara Falls, right, the Canadian Falls, and came into Niagara, he would be afforded, I mean, afforded the same protections. And guess what? Ooh, we can strip him of those protections. As long as he's outside the U.S., he doesn't have, there is no reach, this whole thing about reach. That's why they have to extradite him. So wait a second. So if he comes over here, he doesn't have a defense. He can't use a defense that someone that's a U.S. A citizen or, or foreign no, national. He, he, he wouldn't because it's Espionage Act plus Co Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which is Espionage Act light when it's applied against someone like myself, because that's ultimately what I plan out to, because it's under the U.S. Code, you know, Criminal Code Title 18. So they have to bring him. They can't indict him, like go forward with trial overseas. He's in a sovereign country, right? But he's in one of their prisons. They have to extradite him. So they need to extradite him. So then he has rights, which would be afforded under the Constitution, but then they get to violate him. And, exactly and, what... And Tom, so, because, you know, we only have so much time here. It's yeah. going by quickly. If he's extradited here, he will yeah. be in the same jurisdiction, the same bailiwick as Daniel Hale. But exactly. Won't have, won't have that judge, though. But he'll have the same prosecutor. Well, right now, Gordon Cromberg is the lead attack, the lead chief, the kind of chief senior litigator on the Assange case. Yes. So. What happens? What happens when he gets there? What kind of protections would he have? He would not have the protections that I would have or that. As well, he said. should. I'm just saying he should. But they're going to put up one heck of I mean, I can imagine because then they're just going to be salivating. Right. Because now they can strip him of every possible right that he's actually afforded because he's in the United States. You still have due process. It's not like due process disappears just because he's a foreign citizen, but now he's in the United States. He's not under the jurisdiction of like the UK system. He's not. He would be under the jurisdiction once extradited and he'd be treated even worse because he would, you're right in the sense he, he's a foreign national, but he's supposed to have the same access Ability to mount a defense just like an American citizen. Look, we've had what you call Title Three, Article Three, but you know, I'm saying Article Three, sorry, Article Three courts, the federal with the worst of the worst. Guantanamo was extra constitutional, out of sight, out of mind, although the Supreme Court actually argued differently. Are we, unfortunately, we still have many of the vast majority in Guantanamo enemies of the state. They were never enemy combatants. They just found themselves in the wrong place at the wrong time and got picked up and said, we've, we've labeled you an enemy combatant. You're really a bad dude. Now, are there bad dudes? I'll just say that in quotes, of course, right? They're there. But the reason they haven't been able to go forward is because they were tortured. And you can't use any evidence, coerced evidence from a torture session as, as part of your case you know, against a defendant. So if he's in the United States, you know, in an Article Three court, which would be EDVA, guess what? Due process applies. Right. Uh, just uh, let me drift off a little bit about the Guantanamo uh, uh, detainees 
they've been there for 20 years, many of them. How appalling is that to you? Uh, Utterly Tom? appalling. Obama said he was going to shut it down one year after he became president, and it never happened, and it still hasn't happened. And there's still a few dozen there. I mean, I it just it's it's it truly is appalling. And they keep. I mean, it's gone for on for so long that those who've been who are there are getting old. They got medical conditions. I mean, my gosh. I mean, twenty years they've gone through multiple military prosecutors. Yeah. Well. I, but it's a penal colony. It is a penal colony, but they haven't been charged with anything they're not going to be tried for anything they're going to run the clock out so long i mean (laughs) it's going to run the clock out now they have slowly released some some that were authorized but it took years i mean (laughs) it just took years for those that were even released to be released i mean it's, it's just extraordinary league egregious i mean this is this is america this is I mean, so many of them are innocent. They actually had nothing to do with what the government has alleged. Well, wait a second. We invaded Afghanistan. So if they were defending their country when they were invaded, why are they enemy combatants? What did they do? They were there and we declared them as such. If we pulled them off the battlefield, they must have been against us. I mean, this gets into that whole otherism where you label others that are not you as the enemy. I mean, this has been, this is unfortunately one of the centerpieces of this entire sad drama of the human condition, right? It's so convenient to actually declare someone other. And if you have the power, then guess what? I mean, look at America's history. Look at our original sin. Look at the genocide against uh, the indigenous peoples. Look at what we did with the blacks, right? We, they were slaves for Christ's sake. It was built into the Constitution. Right. Well, uh, or if, immigrants. Look how we treated certain immigrants or some we didn't let in because they were the wrong kind. We were supposed to be the melting pot. There's so many contradictions for all the aspirational idealism, which Daniel Hale represents. He's part of a long line, including his own his own his own history, his own heritage, right? Yes, like With you. Ed, Edward Hale and Nathan Hale, who's actually considered an American hero because he was a spy who went into New York City and even and Daniel even turns so it wasn't a very good spy because he ended up, guess what? Yeah, he got hung because... He committed espionage. Well, How he made that. I wait won. a second, Tom. He made an allusion to that about yeah. his own, that he only had one, one life. I'm talking Good. about Daniel Hale. That's he only correct. Had one life. That's when the tears started so, streaming down my face. Yes. When he said that. He was willing to give up his life. It would save just one or a few or many because of what he was eyewitness to. You can only imagine, there is his, his life was part of a system that was murdering people unnecessarily so, even with the claimed precision targeting. It wasn't precision targeting. Hellfire missiles and others are just, you know, in airplane, just being, just, hey, if anybody else is around there, he was eyewitness. We're not talking ter- secondary tertiary or he was eyewitness. He was part of that system. Yeah, but he kind of kept his mouth shut and lived a great life. He got he some uh, citations. I mean, he couldn't. I couldn't. Ellsberg couldn't. Other Jocelyn Radak couldn't when she was part of the, the, the original epigenesis of the torture regime. Right. You know, I couldn't. Well, you right? couldn't. I want to talk about that. I could. No, so you couldn't. But you had spent 20 years serving your country. You were there in a top position. And what drove you? Why couldn't you just keep it quiet and move on and have a great because life? Because I would have, I would, if I had been quiet, I guess what? I would have been supporting, I mean, I would have, even by default, right? The subversion of my own form of government constitutional republic that I had taken oath support and defend. 
I wasn't going to participate in that. And then not only had the wheels come off, we were in an entirely different vehicle. This gets back to Cheney. Cheney is now ascendant. Cheney was a shadow president. He was really the national security president. Uh, the, and, he, and that was seeded. That was all given to Cheney by Bush. And so here now is his opportunity to use 9-11. And by the way, counterterrorism was not a priority during the first few months of the Bush administration. It was backwater. In fact, U.S. was still struggling. Who's the next enemy? I mean, remember, this is very Orwellian. You know, you're, look, you're, you're looking for East Asia. I mean, Oce Oceania is always, right, always at in conflict. So you're looking for the next enemy. So post 45 years, an anomaly in terms of history, you know, you have this interesting period of the 90s, and now who's the next enemy? 9-11 defined it as a global war on terrorism. He said five days after 9-11, we're going to go to the dark side. I don't think people fully appreciate what that meant. Now he gets to restore the imperial presidency because he always had said Nixon got a raw deal. To Cheney. All right, so and that's and what he starts right. doing. He starts exercising extra constitutional authorities as if it was wartime when it's not declared wartime. And so secret decisions are being made at the highest levels, you know, with his imprimatur and obviously with the stamp of President Bush and others and, and obviously being supported, you know, by the head, you know, we had, you had the head of George Tenet, the head of the CIA, also director of central intelligence. You had Michael B. Hayden, head of NSA and others, that very small group, right, are taking us, the guardrails are gone. We're now we're now in its exigent conditions. It's it's emergency. I mean, we have an emergency. I mean, I this is what I was confronted by. I wasn't going to remain silent. I'd be complicit in 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 state crimes. And ironically enough, then I'm the one ultimately is charged. The only one charged to date. The only one that ultimately, after being extensive extensively investigated, here I am convicted in sentence of what for daring to expose the secret surveillance regimes, the 9-11 mistakes, the errors, right? Cover up, never should, I mean, just a failure, the failures and massive, massive fraud, waste and abuse. Well, Tom, I, that's, I wanna talk about this. I mean, because I'm doing this backwards. I should have uh, uh, begun talking about your background, but it's okay. I, I, I do wanna talk about your background. When you were at the NSA, what you witnessed, and then the hell that you went through by responding to what your witness, what you witnessed. Within and, days uh, and weeks of 9-11, I was confronting my own supervisor, the number three person NSA. I went to the inspector general's office. I can, I okay, this is, and, and I actually also talked to the, 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 the lead attorney in the office of general counsel. I mean, this is an extraordinary moment. First week in, in first week in October. I didn't know at the time, but this is the secret presidential finding that authorized NSA to basically treat the United States as if it was, you know, a foreign nation for the purpose of mass surveillance. Oh, but we don't know where they are. They're all amongst us, right? They're, we've got to, we need the data. You don't understand, Mr. Drake. But he said, the White House has approved the program. They called it the program. It's all legal all legal. This threw me right back to Nixon. Remember, my civic awakening, Randy, was the 1970s. No one was above the law. We had all the scandals, including surveillance, CIA, chaos, Minaret, you know, NSA. I, it's, you know, FBI, COINTELPRO. Co so you I know. The Army spying on Americans. And yes. now in secret, we're unleashing the power of NSA to just go anywhere. And, and then it, you have these interesting partnerships with telecoms and other concerns just to sweep up all this data because we don't know where the threat is. We just need the data. So it's become this absolute hoarding obsession to, to collect it all. Well, that throws me back to the Stasi because that's the country that I used to listen in on during the Cold War. Right? Yes. Where that was the mantra, right? Know it all, right? So collect it all, know it all. So he collected all the know it all. Well, wait a second. Why did they, it, was this motivated by money? 
uh, for the NSA or was it motivated by uh, Both. some other evil? Triggered. No, the failure, I, the, 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 the egregious nature, the failure was not, let's actually determine what, remember, it was never, this was never supposed to happen, Randy. We had Pearl Harbor, which triggered our entry into World War II. It was never supposed to happen. We would never again be surprised. That's why the national security state was one of the huge motivators. We will never again be surprised. They put this a gigantic forward facing, outward facing surveillance system in place as part of the National Security Act. And NSA comes along in secret, signed in secret, created in secret uh, by the uh, Harry S. Truman's pen. It was not legislated into law. By the way, the FBI wasn't either. Wow. So, so you wow. have these organs. So here we are, right? Cheney now. Wow. Here's his opportunity. He's the shadow president of the national security state for all intents and purposes. And so he went as far as he could. He was going to restore the imperial presidency and then some. So the gloves come off, right? We go to the dark side. We go to the dark side. So it didn't they, matter what they the law was. talked about that. Extra no. legal. It didn't matter. So then the Patriot Act is passed, but then that got secretly interpreted. You didn't even have all you had to have, basically all you had to have was reasonable, articulable suspicion. That became the standard. But it was just it was just smoke. It was just a, it was just cover. It was a fig leaf to just get access to data by any means. Didn't matter. Right. There was no distinction between what it was to be a U.S. citizen, a, a U.S. person. And anybody else, for all intents and purposes, you're lumped in with everybody else. It doesn't so matter. Let me, let me everybody, this. everybody's suspicious, Randy. Right. Potentially, well, wait, I got. I got to ask you this because you only have a few yeah, minutes sure. left. Uh, Go ahead. What you just laid out there. So now you're confronted with this. You see it now. Yeah. World agency. You could have kept quiet. You could have gone on and maybe be I, head of the NSA, but the, you chose a moment like Daniel Hale to speak out. I know I could I wouldn't I couldn't have lived with myself. No, neither could Daniel have lived with himself if he hadn't spoken out. So ultimately, I went through every whistleblower channel that existed, including being part of formal investigations. I contacted congressional staffers, the very committees formed in the late 70s. They were supposed to provide oversight of the secret side of government, who themselves have become increasingly co-opted over the years. So there was one final channel I could go to. First yeah. Amendment channel, grievances against your own government. I could go to the press. But I knew going to the press, just like Ellsberg had, I knew because I was the first whistleblower since Ellsberg ultimately charged under the Espionage Act for non spy activities. I knew if I went to the press, I was really putting myself in a vice. I already knew that. The anvil of the government power it was just going to be pounded. They were just going to use it to pound me. Right. So, so they did. They did. And uh, so you went to the press and uh, there were some stories written and then you get popped for it. Uh, you anticipated that. And you have I know you have no regrets doing it because you couldn't live with yourself if you hadn't. No, I never I could not have lived with myself. It would have been a far greater burden if I had not spoken up. If I had not actually gone to the press in the end, but if, if I hadn't said anything. And I knew going through all the whistleblower channels in the government were exposure channels. I already knew that too. This is all eyes wide open. And I was well aware of what had happened to Ellsberg. And now it's post 9-11. It's under Bush and Cheney of all people. Right. So, Especially Cheney. Yes, of course. He's the doctor. He's the doctor. Strange. I knew that. I, I knew all of that. And I, I mean, so I, yes, it's true. Like Daniel, I was willing to give up my life, sacrifice my life. And if necessary, there'll be the government sacrificing my life on the altar of national security. They blew out most of my life as it was. But the only thing I had left was myself, my own integrity. I mean, well, you know what? People yes, you know, that's true. And you inspired uh, Ed Snowden and Ed Snowden ascribes uh, what he did to you. He went and, and released the stuff because of how they went after you. Can you talk about that for a couple of minutes? Well, I had always hoped that someone like Snow would come along to, to 
uh, yet another whistleblower, whether anonymously or named, would come along to expose the fuller metastasization of the surveillance state. And that's exactly what he did, especially with respect to NSA. Right. And of course, Daniel was inspired. Yes. Chelsea Manning. I mean, people, this was actually said said yesterday when he stood up in front of the judge, his extraordinary words, right? Um, It was Chelsea Manning that actually, because of what Chelsea, the risk that was taken, right? I mean, so he was willing to sacrifice his own life if necessary. I mean, it doesn't, Ellsberg himself has said this, I've said this, and, and that's why I've been in the loop with Daniel since 2014. I am well aware of how difficult it is, especially when you're a whistleblower of significant consequence with respect to national security and revealing abuse of federal power, right? At that level, you're gonna get more than scratched. Okay, you're you're gonna take it. It's and they're gonna come down hard. I'm I'm fortunate that I I was able to remain free. But see, that in itself is what's at stake here, Randy. The very thing that makes us who we are as human beings, not just the United States, but around the world. I mean, like we can't be who we are without life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those extraordinary words in the, in our, the America's own Declaration of Independence. I, it's, you know, all men are created. All persons are created equal. Now, yeah, there was a lot of unequalness and there obviously still is in this world, but those, the aspirational nature of what it means to an American was always the great hope. The a- aspirational nature of what it means to be a human being. This is a community of us. Right. Well, and yet, you know, I, so, that, that's an amazing uh, peroration. Uh, you know, I, 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 we're at the end of the show and I could talk to you for and I'll, I'll bring you back real soon to continue the, this discussion. We've been uh, talking to uh, former NSA senior uh, official executive uh, Thomas Drake, whistleblower, award winning uh, whistleblower. Uh, Thomas Drake, uh, you're you're my hero. You really are a profile in courage and this was an incredible discussion here on my maiden voyage at uh, Progressive Radio Network, and I really appreciate you uh, being on. It's been a real pleasure once again to speak with you. Well, thank you for being part of your new launch, uh, Randy. Yeah. Uh, and I look forward to returning. All right, uh, that's it. Uh, I'm Randy Credico, uh, live on the fly in a special edition of uh, Assange Countdown to Freedom here on the Progressive Radio Network. We'll see you next Monday uh, at 10 a.m. in the morning. Thank you very much and uh, see you soon. O Badoglio, Pietro Badoglio, ingrassato dal fascio littorio, col tuo degno compare Vittorio, ci hai già rotto abbastanza i coglioni. Las my dit parei, las my fight parei, las my dit, las my fight, las my dit parei, las my di russissi, las my falu, no no, tutto questo salvarti non può. Ti ricordi quando eri fascista e facevi il saluto romano, o dal duce stringevi la mano, sei davvero un gran bel porcaccio. Ti ricordi l'impresa d'Etiopia e il ducato di Addis Abeba, meritavi di prender la meba ed invece facevi milioni.